So the Snapdragon 8 Gen 4 is here, and it's not called that, but it might still be the biggest deal in smartphone silicon in years. Let me explain. The Snapdragon 8 Elite is the successor to Qualcomm's earlier Snapdragon 8 Gen 3, and it's just been announced at the Snapdragon Summit event in Maui. So outside of the obvious, the fact that it'll inevitably power the lion's share of Android flagships in 2025, why does this chip matter? The biggest reason has to do with technology that's been brewing for the past several years, which has also been responsible responsible for Qualcomm finally breaking into the PC market in a big way this past year. The secret source in this chip is Qualcomm's Orion cores. That's Orion with a Y, by the way. First seen in the Snapdragon X Elite, these cores were the product of Qualcomm's acquisition of chip startup Nuvia in 2021. Nuvia was built by industry veterans, including several Apple alums, responsible for the A and M series chips that have seen Apple dominate in performance per watt. So these guys know what they're doing, as evidenced by the power and efficiency of that X Elite chip, allowing Qualcomm to bring the heat to Intel in the laptop world and establish a foothold for battery-friendly performance for Windows on ARM. Qualcomm and Microsoft have the Orion microarchitecture to thank for that. The Snapdragon X series of laptop chips uses first-generation Orion cores, and now Qualcomm's bringing second-gen Orion cores to its smartphone chips with the Snapdragon 8 Elite. So Qualcomm's branding, which, let's be honest, is often kind of a mess, actually sort of makes sense here. In any case, the pitch with Snapdragon 8 Elite is bringing laptop-level performance to a flagship smartphone SoC without sacrificing the efficiency and battery longevity that Qualcomm in general and the past couple generations of Snapdragon flagships in particular have become known for. Orion replaces the old series of semi-custom cryo CPUs, which had been around since the days of the Snapdragon 820 in 2016. In the cryo era, Qualcomm had come close to performance parity with Apple, but never quite got there. And Qualcomm's new core designs also contrast with MediaTek's recently announced Dimensity 9400, which, as usual, toes closer to the standard off-the-shelf ARM Cortex core designs. The arrangement of cores in the Snapdragon 8 Elite is also quite different from previous generations, consisting of two prime cores and six performance cores, thus eliminating the efficiency cores from the 8 Gen 3 and earlier chips. Those are the very low power but extremely efficient cores designed to keep things ticking along when the phone is idle or otherwise not doing very much. Qualcomm doesn't seem to view the absence of efficiency cores as much of a big deal, though. Speaking to Android Central, Shaheen Farahani, senior product manager for the Snapdragon 8 Elite, said that Qualcomm's performance cores held up equally as well as ARM's efficiency cores in lower-powered tasks. So effectively, these six cores pull double duty as your efficiency cores at lower voltages. Kind of seems to bring us back to the old days of Big Little, with two very high-performance cores and several less power-hungry workhorse cores. Snapdragon 8 Elite Elite is built on TSMC's second gen 3 nanometer node, allowing for a chart topping 4.32 GHz peak clock speed for those two prime cores, and likely allowing for some of the impressive power savings compared to 8 gen 3 that we'll get to in a little bit. With Orion, then, Qualcomm claims to have restored performance leadership to the Android ecosystem from the iPhone, showing benchmarks to back that up. Though looking at Qualcomm's own numbers here, it does seem to be stronger versus Apple in multi threaded tests versus single threaded. Even so, being being able to best Apple Silicon in any area is no small feat, and that message of this being a laptop-level chip was only reinforced by some pretty favourable comparisons in terms of performance and power consumption versus notebook chips including Intel's second-gen Lunar Lake Core Ultra 7. Demonstrates just how far Qualcomm has come in terms of raw power, but also the extent to which x86 still has to downclock quite a bit on battery power. As always with benchmarks like these and normalized scores like the ones shown here, the devil is going to be in the details. No SoC exists in a vacuum, and important characteristics like any throttling will depend on how device manufacturers are using this chip just as much as Qualcomm's new microarchitecture itself. And there'll be similar questions to answer around lower power tasks and idle power consumption given the lack of efficiency cores in this new chip. That said, Orion has a proven performance pedigree, and the headline percentage improvements for this chip versus Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 are very impressive. 45% single and multi-core improvement, and power savings for the CPU and GPU also in the mid-40% range. Plus, there are some promising early benchmarks out there from sources who already have access to some of these upcoming Snap 8 Elite phones. 
Speaking of which, it looks like Xiaomi will be first out of the gate with the Xiaomi 15 series bringing Snapdragon 8 Elite to global markets. But the Asus ROG Phone 9 Pro, which is likely to include its own heavy duty heat pipe and other game centric cooling capabilities, will likely give us a look at the real limits of the performance of this chip under ideal thermal conditions. And that kind of thing will be especially important considering the high uptick in GPU and ray tracing performance touted by Qualcomm this time around. Those numbers are all well and good, but how long will the chip actually be able to perform at that level versus an 8 Gen 3 or an iPhone? It wouldn't be a mid-2020s phone-related announcement without a good chunk of it being dedicated to artificial intelligence, and Qualcomm didn't disappoint in this area either. The Hexagon MPU gets a 45% performance boost compared to 8 Gen 3, and the Image Signal processor is now an AI ISP, with smart image processing capabilities built for intelligence segmentation and object detection. So what does that mean? Well, the most impressive and cutest demo shown on stage involved a particular pupper named Blue, demonstrating the new ISP's ability to understand objects in the scene in real time, and snapshots when your pet is either doing something cool or looking directly at the camera. Potentially a whole lot more useful than the spray and pray approach where you just rapid fire a bunch of photos and hope you catch your cat or dog at the right nanosecond. A lot was also made of the new NPU's ability to empower fully on-device AI assistance with the accompanying demo reel showing how this could work. Though this kind of thing always feels a bit weird to me without input from software vendors themselves. Nobody's going to be saying, hey assistant, after all. So it's down to the platform holders to implement actual user facing features around the technology Qualcomm's built here, whether it's Gemini, Bixby or Honor's China centric yo-yo assistant, which was also demoed on stage. So Qualcomm is pitching the jump from Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 to Snapdragon 8 Elite as a much bigger than usual generational leap. And given the importance of Orion and the performance numbers it's been able to produce, it's probably right to do so. Qualcomm having a smartphone chip that beats Apple roundly in multi-core and manages to just about scrape ahead in single core is a big deal indeed, and an important milestone on the journey it began with its acquisition of Nuvia back in 2021. What's more, being able to offer this kind of performance along with the AI power demanded by phone brands these days without falling into the pitfalls of high power consumption will be equally impressive if Qualcomm can pull it off. We already got some brief hands-on time with the ROG Phone 9 Pro at the Snapdragon Summit, and we'll have some more time with Qualcomm's new hotness as devices like the Xiaomi 15 and OnePlus 13 make their way out to global markets including Europe over the next few weeks. As for North America, the OnePlus device will probably be your first chance to experience the 8 Elite, with that phone likely to arrive before Samsung's S25 series in early 2025. But picking up a phone with this fancy new chip might end up setting you back a pretty penny. Reports from Chinese social media leaker Digital Chat Station point to a 20% bump in cost for the chip versus the 8 Gen 3, which matches early reports from Taiwanese analyst Ming-Chi Kuo. That added expense apparently stems from TSMC's cutting-edge N3E manufacturing process used in both the 8 Elite and MediaTek's Dimensity 9400. So whichever flagship chip you're packing in 2025, it's likely it'll leave a bigger dent in your wallet. That's it for now, let us know in the comments which SoC you're using in your phone at the moment and what you think of the Snapdragon 8 Elite, whether it might tempt you to pick up a new phone in the months ahead. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.